We're sitting here in Minneapolis with Bill Porter, who is also known as Red Pine. And as Red Pine, he has translated so many important works that uh, enrich our understanding of ancient Chinese poetry. Bill, how did you come to take the name Red Pine? Mm. Well, I went to Taiwan to live in a monastery, and my monastic name, Buddhist monastery in Taiwan, and my name was Victorious Cloud. You know, it's, it's sort of a monastic name, Shengyun. And uh, after uh, four years in these two different monasteries, you know, the abbot finally said, you know, you've been hanging out here for a while, and it's, isn't it time you became a monk? And uh, I didn't want to be a monk, so I left. And, uh, lived in this farming village for the next 14 years uh, on top of this mountain um, above Taipei, um, and I needed I needed uh, I needed a new name. I needed a street name. <laughs> you know, you can't use Victorious Cloud in a polite company. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I taught English to support myself. Three evenings a week, I would come down the mountain. Um, on this bus, and I teach English Monday, Wednesday, Friday from six to eight, and made enough money. Yeah, I think it was made about three hundred dollars a month to to support myself. Anyway, one one day the the bus stopped at a at a sign advertising Black Pine Cola, and I said to myself, "That's the name I'm looking for," but black is not a Chinese color; it's Japanese color. Hmm. Uh, red is the Chinese color, so I started using this name, Red Pine. And uh, about maybe about six months later, I was doing some research, and I discovered the first great Taoist in Chinese history was Master Red Pine. Hmm. That it was a real name. He was the reign master of the Yellow Emperor. So I said, "Wow, it's a real name." Yeah. And it also sort of it accounted for the connection I feel with the Chinese language when I'm translating. That uh, it's sort of like being a, a, a a shaman right. channeling, um, so I basically took Red Pine's name because uh, Red Pine seems to be my muse. Yes, uh, accounts for the inspiration I receive because I have no idea where I get it from. Uh, so anyway, I started using that name because uh, the first uh, couple books I published were self-published little Chinese editions, hmm. you know, string-bound stuff that I I. I published in Taiwan and sent to friends in America. And so I could get away with a name like Red Pine. Yeah. It wasn't until many, many years later, it was in around 99 or so, I was publishing the Diamond Sutra, a translation of the Diamond Sutra with Jack Shoemaker at Counterpoint. And at some point, Jack said, you know, Bill, I've talked to my marketing people and uh, we got to get rid of Red Pine. He, it's just too new agey, you know, for the market. Um, I, we're we're going to go with Bill Porter on this one. And I said, well, look at Jack. I want to sell books too, so y you decide. And uh, about two weeks later, he calls me up and he says, well, I just talked to Gary. Gary says it's Red Pine. Red, it's Red Pine. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm, I'm stuck with Red Pine whenever I translate. But I, I'd throw it away in a minute if I could sell more books. But, <laughs> but the, in my marketplace is so small in America, it wouldn't make any difference what name I used. Well, don't throw it away too quickly. I want to jump back to something you said uh, that it, it helped you get into the mo t a frame of mind to uh, translate. And I yeah. wanted to ask, what, what is your practice or ritual or, or how do you go about uh, uh, translating when you do. Well, I have to find a book that I want to yeah. translate, yeah. It, and it, it's sort of karmic. I, books that I work on just happen to somehow fall into my hand. Uh, maybe I'm in a bookstore, um, and I come across a book, and I say, "Wow, that is really, really neat stuff." Um, take it home and start looking at it. And I said, "You know, I could, I could do this." So the books I've done are I've just sort of come into my possession like that, and I worked on them. Uh, Didn't you say Cold Mountain you found at that monastery? Oh, well, yeah, actually, when I, the, the, the first thing I translated was Cold Mountain. Yeah. Um, the abbot published uh, a Chinese edition of Cold Mountain by a, a Taiwan scholar, and it had some uh, vernacular 
information about it. So not just the classical Chinese, uh -huh. but there was a, a couple notes in, in vernacular, modern Chinese, by this scholar. And he, uh, the, the editor, well, I guess the abbot, pirated Burton Watson's English translations and stuck them at the back. Hmm. So I could see the Chinese, and I could see uh, what a competent translator did for a hundred of the 300 poems. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I still have that edition. Uh, so I, I, and that's how I started translating, is I, with Burton Watson's help. Mm. Um, bless his soul. Yeah. Um, he died yesterday in, in Tokyo at the age of 91. Complications following a stroke. Lovely man, but at, in the monastery, I started translating these poems by Cole Mountain, and um, then I left the monastery, and I just kept doing them in this farming village I moved to, and then I, I got up to about 150 of the 300 poems, and and um, I didn't. I sent them to some publishers, uh, uh, Weatherhill, Tuttle, that specialized in in, in the Japanese Chinese stuff, and. They, they they turned that project down, and I didn't know what to do with them. So I, I was translating a martial arts text on the side for an Australian friend, and he he I asked, you know I, I told him this quandary of mine, and he said, "Well, you know, you've got all these books on your shelf by John Blofeld. Why don't you ask him?" So I didn't know. I just sent a letter to John Blofeld, taking care of his publisher, and about a month later, I get a letter back from John. And he says, why don't you send me your translations of the first ten? And I did. And a couple weeks later, I get them back just covered with notes. Covered. He says, send me ten more. That's the best. And, and, and we went for the next, over the course of the next year, I did all 300. Hmm. Uh, and he would just cover, I still have the manuscripts of, of my, my translations, you know, very corny just covered with all kinds of uh, notes, sometimes in English, sometimes in Chinese. Um, and we became really great friends. Um, and then finally, I uh, got to the point where I, I met a, a, an American in Taiwan who knew a publisher in, in Washington State, in Port Townsend, called Copper Canyon, a guy named Sam Hamill, who uh, said he'd be happy to publish them. And so that's how they got published. But... Before that, I needed an introduction, so I flew to uh, I flew to Bangkok to meet meet John, hmm. my old smuggling boss. Uh, uh, while I was working on the on the that 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 book, uh, I smuggled watches every week to <laughs> to Korea, high end watches, and um, it gave me a lot of time to on airplanes, you know, airports and and in hotels to 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 finish that. And the boss. Uh, gave me a, a ticket to Bangkok as a, as a little present. I told him I need an introduction for my book, so he sent me to, to Bangkok to meet Blofeld. And I, you know, anyway, that's how that book got published and how it got published. It, uh, and I, I, I had the Abbott's book uh, of Coleman's poetry with Burton Watson's translations. And then when I moved out of the monastery to the city, or to to the mountain, I'd come down and, and uh, meet this girl every week in in uh, Taipei. Um, and uh, I, I went to a, a, a bookstore that had uh, Qing Dynasty editions of Cole Mountain. And I got this Qing Dynasty edition, and somebody had, the editor had put the poems of Stonehouse after Cole Mountains. So when I finished, when I finished Cole Mountains, I said, who's this other guy? That guy. This guy, Stonehouse. Yeah. And so I said, wow, these poems are even better than Cole Mountains. <laughs> wow. And nobody... I've ever met in China or Taiwan has ever heard of this guy, and yet he's he's just a great poet. So I, I did another book of, of Stonehouse. Um, so and so it's sort of like one book has led to another. Um, generally, when I work on a book, it, I'd say I, it takes me about a year, year and a half to do a book. Um, you know, depends on how many poems, what kind of, of text it is. Well, what about your, in addition, your commentary? Your commentary is extensive and so learned, and, and then, of course, your geographic commentary. Well, uh, yeah, well every book that I translate or uh, work on, I buy 30 books. Yeah, I figured. You know, I, I, I ransack the Chinese live, the bookstores in Hong Kong, Taiwan, and occasionally in China, um, and collect books, you know, the, on, on that subject or, you know, off. Because 
translating is is a is a great way to learn. Mm -hmm. It forces you to, to learn a lot more than you really uh, um, thought that was there. Because mm -hmm. when you just read a poem, you just you know it's sort of uh, at a at a certain level. But when you start to translating it, you have to go much deeper into it. So I would uh, accumulate all this. I don't want to say knowledge, but access to knowledge, and I would feel that if I'm going to convey this to a Western audience, they want to know what a Chinese person knows about this. So I felt commentary, mm -hmm. adding commentary. In fact, commentary is a, is a literary art in China and probably is in Japan too. Yeah. Um, we don't have it in the West. The, <laughs> the, only, the only book I've ever seen in the West uh, which, where the commentary is is a uh, of literary quality is is a uh, uh, what's his name's uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Oh, oh yeah, uh, God, I forget that guy's yeah. name. Evans? No, we know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, some English scholar. Oh, I mean, we're yeah. we're having a brain fart. We, we know who he is. A brain fart, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that that that's the only time I've ever seen notes, uh, footnotes that were just amazing. Um, yeah. But anyway, this is what the Chinese do as a literary art. Mm -hmm. is have commentary because the Chinese are, you know, the self-effacing people, like, like the Japanese in a sense, and they don't want to put their thoughts on the cover of a book, so they hide them behind somebody else's work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and interlinear or, uh, footnotes, commentary, whatever, so that they can, they can, uh, they can uh, represent Buddhist uh, philosophy or Taoist philosophy without... Uh, Putting blazing in the, their name on a on a separate text, but it's it's a Tao Te Ching with my commentary, <laughs> and and um, so the Chinese uh, whenever whenever I have worked on a book, I have gone to the bookstores in in Taiwan and, and found the best commentaries right. uh, I could get, and so I quote a lot of commentary material right. because I feel that uh, Westerners need help understanding these these texts and, and and I try to give them the same background that a Chinese an educated Chinese person would have by you know including the commentary right um, now this question would hopefully be valid at any time but uh, but feel free to make it as pointed for our time as you would like what does ancient Chinese poetry have to teach us contemporary Americans today Well, it should make make sense. Um, I mean, I read a lot of English poetry. I can't figure out. <laughs> I mean, I, I speak English. I can read English, but I, I often the poems are so personal, based on personal experience that somehow would benefit by a commentary. But I don't have access to to that knowledge. Mm -hmm. of where this poem is coming well said, from. Well said. And, and um, of course, Chinese poetry can be like that too, uh, because it's um, a lot of poetry was in China by the great poets was just written as a present for a friend at a party, um, somebody going away. Um, so it, it has a personal quality, um, and of course it helps to know the occasion and, and know the information about it, but it's, it's, poetry is, is very personal. The... Uh, in ancient China, you could not get a job as an official if you were not a poet. That was one of the requirements. There are four requirements. One of them, you had to write poetry, and you were tested on your poetry. Otherwise, no job. Um, because you expected at multiple occasions to produce something. Uh, so poetry had a place in Asia, and especially in China, that it has never had, never will have. West. Uh -huh. When you walk into a Chinese house, an apart, whether it's an apartment or an estate or whatever, first thing you see when you come in through the front door is there's a poem facing you on the wall, a scroll. Usually it's divided into two parts, and then maybe there's a, a painting between the two parts. But uh, poetry is, is, is the great literary art in, in, uh, in China. And it's, it's pop, pop. The feeling is this, the, 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 the a long time ago, the, they, the Chinese had a, uh, the first book of poetry was compiled by, by Confucius, uh, 
uh, called the Book of uh, Sher Jing, the Book of po Poetry, um, 300 so poems. And uh, about 200 years after he compiled his book, somebody was writing the first commentary on the Book of Poetry. And so he established the first definition we have of poetry in Chinese. It's Zai Xin Wei Zhi, Fa Yan Wei Shi. It's poetry is what is in the heart put into words. And so the character, even the character itself, we have for poetry is words from the heart. Huh. And so poetry has this quality in China that is when when it's very clear that it's coming from the heart, it's it's uh, it's it's what poetry should be. There's plenty of poetry that comes from the head, though, intellectual stuff, where people, you know, write it as a, as craft craft work. But uh, the great poets are are all these heart poets, and so it's it's uh, it's something. I mean, I I've run into a lot of poets that I don't wouldn't even give a, the time of day to. That, uh, that are just you know they just, all they do is do w work with words, but there are these other poets who who are just their heart is somehow coming out into the into, into these these lines, and so I'm attracted to to these people. I want I want to know these people, and so that's that's how I get involved in translation. But I still haven't told you what what what, what all this means for a modern uh, <laughs> Western audience. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm not much when, in tune with the modern. Western audience. In, a, in a way, I think I think you've uh, answered the question perfectly. Uh, <laughs> Bill Porter, Red Pine, thank you, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs>